right, praise God. Yeah, they had a, we had some serious lightning storms, and a tree got hit, but it, when it fell, it missed the house. So, praise God. Justin? Yeah. Yeah, it is exciting. We should praise God for that, right? And these are like fifth or sixth grade boys, right? And it's their initiative. They wanted to have a Bible study together. Yeah, their idea. That yeah, you you just sit there and look pretty, Justin. You're like me. You add panache, and not much else. You know. I <laughs> know. Just kidding. Anybody else? Yeah, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah, it always cheers my heart to to see how much people in this church do that isn't part of the official church activity, you know. We don't have a special ministry help with auction, right? It's just people showed up and wanted to help. And I'm sure we showed up not to help, sorry, but just to cheer on Marvin and make sure he was doing all right. So All right. Well, let me pray and then we'll we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this body in Christ, for this church. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. Thank you that we get to love on one another, trying to show the love that we know we're receiving from you. Unconditional, sacrificial, unwavering love. Help us to become that body, the one that shines your light out these doors to people who don't know Jesus yet. Help us to be a church that does amazing acts of love for each other and even for people we don't know. Let us reflect you and represent you well. And we pray for fruitfulness, that we could reproduce your image in others, helping them come to faith in Jesus and to grow in that faith to become mature disciples of Christ. As we go to your revelation, your word this morning, we pray that you would help us to understand it to see some relevance in it, to find something, some way that we can change our thinking or our lives by using what you have revealed here. We thank you, God, for this opportunity. We pray that you would bless us and that our efforts would be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so how many of you have been on a cruise? Please raise your hands so I can see. Uh, not too bad. I mean, considering Kansas is a landlocked state, right? A few people will not What do you go down to Houston or something? Is that where you take off from? I used to live in Florida, so that wasn't so hard. But what's your favorite destination that you've ever been to on a cruise? Somebody who's who's been on a cruise, just shout it out. Sorry, Bahamas. Okay, somebody else. Bahamas again. Two votes for the Bahamas. They drive on the wrong side of the road there, (laughs) you know. I went to the Bahamas not on a cruise, and every time my cousin and I came out of the hotel, there was the same taxi driver there waiting for us. It was really strange. And, of course, they drive on the other side of the road, and, and he would drive looking back at us. He'd be like, do you know Jesus, man? And I'm like, oh, we're gonna, (laughs) you know, in about two minutes. But... It was a good trip. Anybody else? I've been on a couple of cruises. Eh, They were okay. I enjoyed them. I see the attraction. I'm not sure I'll go on another one. But I'll tell you, I really enjoy looking at cruise brochures. I like to dream about going on a cruise. I mean, I look at all the places I could go. 
And I think, oh, if I took my sweet wife on a cruise, oh, we could go to all these exotic locales and we'd have a week at sea. We could have a room with a view of the ocean. I think Sophia would travel for free, my little girl. If you buy at the right time, well, then you get not only all this free food and soft drinks, but free dining in the fancy restaurants, and not just all the many free activities on the ship, but even some free excursions on the shore. It can definitely be worth it. I can see that. All I got to do to get all of that is pay the fare and get on the ship, right? But what happens if I get to the parking lot and I look up at that big ship and I think, oh no, I can't get on that. And I walk away. How many of those benefits do I get if I don't get on the ship? You know this. None, right? Because I chose to walk away. Now today we're going to talk about how there's a similar dynamic at work in our relationship with God. Not in any way that we have paid for or earn our blessings, okay? Please don't stretch my illustration that far. But there are blessings inherent, built in, to God's way of life. And so when we walk God's way, we just experience them naturally. But when we turn away from God to choose our own path, then we're walking away from those things that were built in over there. Now, we've talked about that before, but today's going to be a little different because we're going to see how that looked under the Mosaic Covenant for Israel and how it looks today under the New Covenant for the church. It's a little bit different. And we'll get to talk about being clean and unclean We're going to get some children and roll them in mud and see what happens. It's going to be a very fun day. So, Before we get to the text, though, well, you should open. You can see the the passage there. You should open your Bible if you want to. Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. The handout is on the inside of your bulletin and then wraps around to the back. Uh, Something about my formatting and faith's formatting is a little different, I guess, but... Before we get to the text, and we will, and we'll see that it's interesting. Even though it's something that God spoke 2,500 years ago, we're going to see how it applies to us today. But first, let me give you some historical context. The first exiles returned to Jerusalem in 538 B.C. On August 29th, 520 B.C., Haggai gave his first prophecy about the people's priorities being off, about their need to be more devoted to God, and more dependent on God. On September 21st, Haggai shared God's encouragement with them. On October 17th, Haggai prophesied about the end times to give the people hope and to give them motivation to trust and obey God and his revelation. We talked about that last week. In late November or early December, Zechariah began prophesying to these same people. On December 18th, Haggai gave two more prophecies, one of which we'll consider today, and then we'll finish our series on Haggai next week with the other one. In 457 B.C., a little over 60 years later, the second group of exiles would arrive, led by Ezra. So that gives you where we're at in the biblical story. So we are today looking at Haggai chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 10. It says, On the 24th day of the ninth month of Persian King Darius's second year, The Lord's message came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has said. Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in a fold of his garment, and that fold touches bread, a boiled dish, wine, olive oil, or any other food, will that item become holy? The priests answered, it will not. Now, as the prophet has done several times already, he refers to God here as Yahweh Tzvaot, which our Bibles translate as Lord of Hosts or Lord Almighty. Tzava referred to military troops. For God, it meant angelic armies. The Bible uses Yahweh Tzvaot when it wants to emphasize Yahweh as the all-powerful God. The prophets would refer to Yahweh in this way when they wanted to frighten the people into revering God or encourage the people into trusting God. And as we said two weeks ago, both of those were necessary at this time. So this all-powerful God had Haggai ask the priests about the law. 
Now, what law do you think interests God? Is it the Persian law, the Babylonian law, the Assyrian law? What law do you think he's talking about? The Mosaic law, right? First given by God through Moses in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then later augmented by other prophets. This is the Mosaic covenant which God had with Israel as his representative people. A set of promises and commands with resulting blessings and curses depending on whether the people kept their part of the covenant and its law. Now, we today need to be very careful to interpret everything we see in the Old Testament after Genesis in light of this law. Because along with the Abrahamic covenant earlier and the later Davidic covenant, this Mosaic covenant and its law was the guiding principle in God's relationship with Israel as his representative people. And everything we see in the historical books, in the wisdom books, or in the prophetic books relates somehow to that relationship and therefore somehow to this covenant and this law. What we call top-line life, walking by faith and obedience, was dependent on the people's response to that revelation. Well, what did the law say about this issue? Actually, almost nothing, (laughs) surprisingly little. But in Leviticus chapter 6, there is discussion about how specially consecrated meat, that is meat that has been set aside for God's use alone, that that meat would be holy and therefore allowed into God's presence. And the garment which carried the meat either would be holy or must be holy. The Hebrew's a little fuzzy, but either way, there was nothing to say that the garment could pass holiness on to something else. So what's God's point? Well, looking at the context of the whole book of Haggai and what Ezra tells us later, perhaps the people of Haggai's day had deluded themselves into thinking that they must be holy or they could gain holiness because of their association with holy things. Maybe they were thinking that just by being born into the people of God, with the holy priests and the holy sacrifices and the soon-to-be-rebuilt holy temple, that they must somehow be holy themselves. And that's not so far-fetched, right? Because people think like that today. I mean, you were born, most of you, in the USA. God's country, right? That's what we think. People from Texas think God still lives there. I mean, it's strange. But you were born in the heartland, right? America's heartland, God's country. Maybe you were born into a Christian family and you were raised in the right sort of church. You're in a good church now. You're part of the worship team or some other ministry in the church. You've even had the pastor and his family over for lunch. You must be holy. And so you might think. But it's not so, is it? You cannot become holy or saved by any earthly association. Verse 13. Then Haggai asked, If a person who is ritually unclean because of touching a dead body comes in contact with one of these items, will it become unclean? And the priest answered, It will become unclean. So God's asking if these same food items would become unclean by touching someone who himself became unclean by touching a corpse. And this is clear in Scripture. The priest knew the answer was yes. Numbers 19.22 Anything that an unclean person touches becomes unclean, and anyone who touches it becomes unclean until evening. You see, uncleanness was transmitted more easily than holiness. It was like a virus, like a disease. And this is probably speaking to the people of this community failing to consider that their association with unclean things had made them unclean in God's sight. And now I'd like to have two child volunteers, and we would slather one of them in mud. I'm just kidding. I'm not really going to do it. I just want to talk about it. But it's good that you're eager. I like that. And a couple of brothers would work for this, because we'd slather one of them in mud and not the other one, and then we'd have them playfully wrestle around like I'm sure they do at home a lot. Now, would the cleanness of the one rub off on the other? No. But would the mud of the other rub off on the one? Sure it would, right? We're not talking about mud, however. So we have to understand what it means to be clean or unclean in the Mosaic Covenant. So here's my attempt at explaining that. Out of everything in our fallen creation, 
God decreed that certain things were clean or unclean in his sight. It was totally his choice. And whatever was clean could then be consecrated, could be set aside for God's purposes, and thereby become holy and be accepted into God's presence. Now, sin could make a person unclean, but you could become unclean without sinning as well. For example, a menstruating woman was unclean because she had blood, but that didn't mean she was sinful, okay? Sinfulness and uncleanness are not the same, so don't put that formula into your head. Everything is tainted in our unpure world and thus impure in what? In God's sight, okay? But whatever God declares to be clean can be consecrated to Him and therefore become holy. Whatever was unclean could not. Now, when things or people went from clean to unclean because of some event, such as touching a dead body or menstruating, there was a way that they could become clean again through some ceremony. And that's why this is sometimes called ritual or ceremonial cleanness. To understand what this means for our story, we have to think about the wider cultural situation. Now, you might remember from our discussion in chapter 1 that Ezra tells us there was external pressure on this community not to rebuild the temple. And this pressure, which deterred the people for almost two decades, was coming from another people group in the area called the Samaritans. The Samaritans were part Hebrew and part Gentile. Their ancestors were a mix of the Hebrews left behind after the exile and the Gentile peoples who were exiled into the land as the Assyrians and Babylonians conquered other places. At first, the Samaritans resented the returning Jews who were given all this prime land in the hill country around Jerusalem. The two groups also did not get along because of a racial bias that went both ways. And the Samaritans had their own form of worshiping Yahweh. They had the real God, but they were worshiping him in a way that was different from Judaism. So race, religion, and economics were working to cause friction between these two people groups, much like we see in places around the world today. As we discussed last week, this post-exilic group of Jews, the ones who had come back from exile, once they began working on the temple again, became disheartened when they realized how hard this was going to be to rebuild the temple with anything like the glory of Solomon's original project. Into the context of these two frustrations, the challenge of building the temple and the Samaritan resistance to building the temple, Ezra tells us that the Persian government issued an edict that the Samaritans should stop resisting temple construction and actually start providing material for it. That must have been pretty welcome news to the Jews. But God had a different perspective. Because the Samaritans did not worship God properly, in God's eyes, they were ceremonially unclean. And so they couldn't contribute anything to the temple that would be holy. Anything they contributed would be unclean and therefore render the temple unclean. Now, I have no doubt God loved the Samaritans and wanted the Hebrews to minister to them and bring them into right worship of God. But the Samaritans were not part of Israel. They were not God's chosen image bearers in that time period or dispensation, as we say. God wanted his people, the Jews, to construct the temple as he had told them to do, to worship him properly, and then bring the Samaritans into proper worship as Gentile believers. And I think that's the issue that God is addressing in this prophecy. So before we go on, let's summarize what we're talking about, all right? Just so we're not confused. The Jews were not holy simply by being associated with holy things like temple building. The Samaritans were not holy simply by being associated with holy things like temple building. What the Samaritans wanted to contribute to the temple would not be holy simply by being associated with holy things like temple. The Samaritans themselves were unclean mostly because of their false worship. And because the Samaritans were unclean, anything they contributed to temple construction would be unclean. And if those materials were used in the temple, the temple itself would be unclean. And as we'll see in the moment, the Jews themselves were now unclean because of their own sinfulness and because of their association with sinful things and unclean things. So before we go on and see what happens in Haggai's community, this is where I want to ask the big question for today. Can we, 
in the church under the new covenant become unclean in God's sight through association with sinful or unclean things. It's a trick question because the answer is no and yes. So let's figure that out. When you accept salvation by God's grace gift, okay, through your faith and the identity of Jesus Christ and his work to atone for you, which means he makes peace with you for you with God and reconciles you with God. In that moment, God justifies you. That means God declares you to be righteous in his sight forever. God justifies you by accounting to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We call this imputed righteousness because it's accounted to you. It's imputed to you legally. This is God's choice. It's his decision to declare you to be clean in his sight. In that moment of salvation, as you are born again or regenerated to new spiritual life, because God has justified you, that is, declared you to be righteous, you also are set apart from the world for God's purposes. Theologians call that positional sanctification. Now, by definition, something holy is something pure that has been consecrated or set apart for God. And since you have both your justification, your declaration of righteousness, and your positional sanctification, you've been consecrated for God's purposes, you are indeed holy in God's sight. And that can never change. By, can't be changed by anybody or anything. So in that sense, you can never be made unclean in God's sight. Not even by association with unclean or sinful people, things, or activities. Your cleanness, your holiness, is based entirely on God accounting to you the righteousness of Christ. It has nothing to do with anything that you do in your life. And that's a big relief, right? You have it. On the other hand, you can experientially, as you know, either walk with God or turn away and walk away from God, right? You can be walking in God's light, in God's will, or you can turn away to walk in the shadows, pursuing your own path. When you sin, you are walking away from God. You are relationally separating yourself from Him. You don't lose your salvation. You can never lose your salvation. But you are tainting yourself and harming the intimacy of your relationship with God. And that's why God allows us to repentantly confess to Him. If we are mired in sin on this wrong path and we sense the conviction that we're no longer walking with God, we can repent, which means to turn away from the sin and turn back to God. We confess by saying, yes, God, I know I was in the wrong. Please help me to continue walking with you going forward. And then we thank Him for His cleansing, His forgiveness, His healing. We see this in 1 John 1, 9, and this is a verse we all ought to memorize. You want this to pop into your head at the right moment. 1 John 1, 9, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. When we repentantly confess, God cleanses us from our unrighteousness, from our sin, restoring us into right relationship with himself. This is is a miraculous tool that God has given us to use to keep us healthy, growing, and in relationship with Him. We should be using this tool every day, right? Any time we sense that we're walking in the wrong path, please don't neglect this miracle that God has placed accessible to your life. All right, let's return to our text. See what's going on in Haggai. Verse 14 After the priest had clarified the issue of cleanness and uncleanness, then Haggai responded, The people of this nation are unclean in my sight, decrees the Lord. And so is all their effort. Everything they offer is also unclean. 
In the weeks before this prophecy, Zechariah had prophesied to the same people about their sin. For example, Zechariah 1.3, This is what the Lord Almighty says, Yahweh Zvaot, right? Lord Almighty, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Because this community was sinful and associated with unclean things, they themselves were unclean in God's sight, and so was everything that they offered God, from their attempts at building the temple to their sacrifices. Now, it's hard for us to understand what a shock that must have been. Temple worship was essential to their religion. Without the temple under the Mosaic Covenant, the people didn't have access to God through the priests, nor could they fully satisfy God with the sacrifices which were supposed to atone until the Messiah Savior would come. In other words, it was supposed to reconcile them to God. Now, God through Haggai was saying, in effect, that everything they offered, from their efforts at building the temple to their supposedly atoning sacrifices, all of that was worthless. It was all unclean. Suppose I told you your baptism didn't count. God was offended when you took communion this month. God thinks your money and your effort in this ministry are worthless. How would you feel? Even that, I'm not sure, is quite the same as what Haggai was telling them. Just being Jews, the chosen representative people, did not make them clean. Just being back in the promised land did not make them clean. Just working on the temple or making sacrifices did not make them clean. They needed to trust and obey God's revelation, the law in the Mosaic Covenant. They had to be walking with God by faith and obedience. Their disobedience made them unclean as did their association with the Samaritans. And now their own uncleanness rendered even their sacrificial worship unacceptable. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, we don't need a temple, right? We don't need priests to have access to God. I always laugh when I go over to somebody's house for lunch and they ask me to pray for the meal. I mean, maybe they're just honoring me, but it's not like God hears me better than you, right? Right? You have full access to God through the Holy Spirit because of Christ. We also don't need to offer animal sacrifices anymore to have peace with God. Jesus has made permanent peace for us with God. So when we screw up and sin, we already are forgiven. And if we repentantly confess, then God will cleanse us, heal us, restore us in relationship with himself. And yet the New Testament does encourage us to sacrifice for God in other ways in our lives for other reasons. In response to God's salvation in which he declares us to be holy, and in response to his miraculous transformation of our character to experientially become more holy in the way we live, in Scripture, God envisions us offering him sacrifices of praise, of kindness and generosity toward others and even devoting our whole lives to him. Let's take a look at that. This is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters in the church, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And yet, I'll say it again, without Jesus, even these sacrifices would be useless, worthless to God. Only Jesus cleanses us and consecrates us to God, sets us apart for God's purposes so that God declares us to be righteous and holy in His sight. So we have to beware today of depending on our religious ritual, whether it's coming on Sunday or going to the Lord's table. We don't want to think that that is what makes us holy. And we also don't want to be doing religious ritual kind of as a habit without really feeling devoted to God and dependent on God. Let's read on. Verse 15. God further speaking through the prophet. He says, Now, therefore, reflect carefully on the recent past, 
before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. From that time, when one came expecting a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 measures from it, there were only 20. I struck all the products of your labor with blight, disease, and hail, and yet you brought nothing to me, says the Lord. So this goes back to when the people first returned to the land from exile. Those first to return no doubt thought that they were the prophesied faithful remnant about to experience all the blessings of the messianic age. But instead of blessing them greatly in the harvest, God had been chastening them all this time until Haggai spoke. The curses of the law, however, had not brought the people effectively into repentance. To do that, it took Haggai's warning to give up their materialism and to make God's work their priority. God continues in verse 18. Think carefully about the past from today, the 24th day of the ninth month, to the day work on the temple of the Lord was resumed. Think about it. The seed is still in the storehouse, isn't it? And the vine, fig tree, pomegranate, and olive tree have not produced. Nevertheless, From today on, I will bless you. So now they were to look back on the past few months since they returned or resumed work, rather, on the temple. Their hope of blessing hadn't occurred yet, even though they were being obedient and working on temple construction. And part of the problem was that the harvest was over. So they were just going to have to muddle on, hoping for a better harvest in the next year. But also, though they had repented of their materialism and focused again on God's work, they had not considered how they had tainted themselves with unclean associations. Despite all that, God promises to bless them, perhaps knowing that again they are going to respond here with repentance to the prophecy. In this case, by refusing Samaritan help and going through what was necessary to become ceremonially clean for God themselves. In the prophecy we looked at last week at the beginning of Haggai chapter 2, God had given the people hope for the eschatological or end times blessing. But now God's bringing hope for blessing in the present and the near future. He would bless them because they were operating in his will. Now they would continue to struggle a little bit because of the weak harvest that resulted from their disobedience. But they should take hope that now things would improve. Under the Mosaic Covenant, Material blessing for the nation, for the community, was a sign of restored relationship with God. Almost a century later, Malachi would speak again of economic suffering as the people again were disobedient. But at least for now, Haggai's community was about to experience God's blessing because they were walking in God's will. Now we in the church, we are under a different covenant. Right? Jesus said he was inaugurating the new covenant with his blood, and the prophets had said that new covenant would replace the Mosaic covenant. But there are some similarities that we might want to note and take with us today. For example, God does sometimes discipline his people today to try to call them back to him. Quoting a proverb as Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Scripture tells us there are other side effects, earthly side effects of our sin. You see them on the screen. This includes such things as jail for legal crimes, right? Deception of the mind and hardening of the heart. We talked about that a few weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 10. Spiritual bondage to sin. Both Jesus and Paul talk about that. Physical illness, a loss of heavenly treasure, and negative effects on other people which I think we discount too much when we're making a decision about which path to take. Also, as we said earlier, when you sin, you damage your relational intimacy with God. You are, in effect, walking away from Him. And though your salvation is not threatened, you are, in effect, walking away from blessings that are inherent in God's way of life. If you're walking in sin instead of with God, can you really expect to sense his empowerment to get through your trials or his transformation into your spiritual maturity, strengthened faith, a growing manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit, the ability to inspire others to faithfulness. 
or spiritual enlightenment. So the choice each day is ours. We can't earn God's love or his salvation, but if we want to experience all the blessings that are promised in Scripture, then we need to choose each day to walk with God on what we call the top line, walking by faith and obedience to his revelation. And if we screw up, and that happens all the time, right? Even to your pastor, okay? I'm sure I've already sinned this morning, and I'm sure I will again. Maybe not before noon, but maybe, right? I still got an hour to go. When we screw up, we know what to do. We can go to God and repentantly confess, be cleansed of that sin, and get back into right relationship with Him. So here's two themes you can take with you today, okay? First, we need to be clean and consecrated for God. And that happens in the legal sense only through faith in Jesus Christ, only by accepting His righteousness as a gift. And second, we need to be clean and consecrated for God. And this happens experientially only when we're walking with God in His light, responding to His revelation by faith and obedience. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your revelation in Haggai. Thank you that our righteousness through Jesus is guaranteed, that your justification can't be changed, that your legal accounting to us of Jesus' righteousness can't be changed, can't be damaged, no matter what we do. Thank you that our salvation is secure. Thank you that you love us in an unwavering way, an unconditional way. But Father, help us also to realize how much we hurt ourselves. By allowing small or big sins into our lives, we in effect not only do things that aren't good in your sight or aren't your will for us, we hurt others, we experience a lot of negative effects of sin, but we're also turning away from many blessings that are just built into walking with you. And so we pray that you would help us each day to not make willful sinful choices. We're going to make mistakes. We thank you for the offer to repentantly confess. Help us to remember that verse and to take advantage of that. God, it's so amazing that you want to have a relationship with us. Help us to appreciate that to the point where we do everything we can to walk with you every day and experience all that you have to offer. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have one more song, and then we'll have our closing comments.